Welcome to another episode of Innovation and the Future of Pharmacovigilance, a podcast series brought to you by Trulian Talks. I'm your host, Indy Alawalia, and I'm delighted to navigate the dynamic world of pharmacovigilance and risk management with you. A quick disclaimer first, the opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of the individual guest and do not necessarily reflect the official views of Trulian Consulting or their own company. We're all about fostering insightful conversations here at Trulliant Talks, and we want you to know that any product vendor or service mentioned does not imply an endorsement. If you're seeking professional advice for specific situations, we encourage you to go to our experts. Please remember this podcast content is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Now that's out of the way, let's get back to the show. Today we are privileged to have... Tom Nichols, who is the director of Drive Phase PV as our guest speaker. Tom, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, Indy. So, Tom, we always start with the uh, traditional icebreaker in every single PV function, which is, uh, how did you get into PV? Uh, I assume, uh, with everyone else has said, I grew up and dreamt as a young boy of (laughs) working in drug safety. Um, But the reality was I... Uh, after university, friends went off to to start their careers, and I stayed on for an extra year to do a, a master's. And sort of come January time, I thought oh, I'd better start thinking about what I'm going to do next September. Uh, and basically, spoke to all my friends from the same course who and and how they were enjoying their their work. Um, and I thought, okay, medical information at Roche sounds quite good. Um, Roche wouldn't have me. Uh, so I, I did start in medical information. I thought it's, um, it seemed to tie together what I kind of from you know, my zoology and epidemiology background and, you know, deeply scientific and, and have a touch on the business side of things. I thought it sounded, sounded perfect. Um, as I started a company called Mertz Pharma um, and quickly found I really didn't like medical information. It, <laughs> it, it, it it was not for me. Um, I kind of found it quite restrained. You know, I didn't find it as as kind of intellectually stimulating as I've subsequently found found drive uh, you know, found pharmacovigilance, um, and particularly having done just done a master's in epidemiology, I was like, oh, actually, I want to really understand kind of well how diseases spread, but like kind of actually the side you know the side effects and adverse events are kind of very similar. Why are these things happening and and what populations are they happening in? So I kind of saw that was going to be I thought that fairly quickly that was going to be my my way out of MI, if you like. Um but I will say going being at, at Mertz kind of was a but you know entirely by chance. You never know, you know, but, um the way you end up working to start with. It was kind of like the best place to start if you're going to start in pharmacovigilance um because they had a product um called clozapine um so for anyone who doesn't know it's a antipsychotic it was um you know it's gold standard treatment for treatment resistant schizophrenia um and it had been banned for a number of years because in i think something like two percent of the population who take it it causes an complete collapse of the immune system and it was idiosyncratic so couldn't predict who it was going to to happen in and you know so it was withdrawn from the market it's not being safe um but it had been brought back um in a very controlled manner and i guess we'd call now sort of additional risk minimization measure so you had the um monitoring scheme so there were three companies involved uh, there was mertz there was novartis and i confess i forget that the third company was um and so all patients on the on clozapine um had to their consultant had to sign a disclaimer to say that they were aware of the risks and the patient was aware had been made aware of the risks um they had to have blood tests as frequently as every week um when they first started to to be dispensed if you didn't have a what we call a green blood result that you neutrophils and um were high enough that you would not get the drug dispensed. If you had, if you if you got a granulocytosis, you were then entered onto a central database that all the companies that all the MAHs had access to that you had to check before you signed someone up. Um, 
so it was a really kind of a perfect example of what pharmacovigilance can do to bring a, mar- a, a drug to market for patients who really need it, who otherwise couldn't. It's at a population level. Mm-hmm. You couldn't you couldn't prescribe it, but in this controlled manner. Um, so I guess yeah, I started my career in PV with this idea of like it was it was always kind of forefront of my mind that this is what PV can do. It wasn't a sitting at a desk processing cases with no idea because you had to do it. You know, I, mm. you know when we started in the industry. It was everyone talks about the evolution from not having it being told you have to have it accepting it to you know a block from you know, a, a guardian from the regulators to a commercial driver well actually i started my career somewhere where it was a commercial driver um having said that um it was also quite interesting and kind of prescient for for now when we talk about the if we bring drugs to market earlier and more post-marketing studies and uh, and, and risk minimization measures um it was entirely commercially unviable as far as i could tell it was <laughs> there you were basically dealing with a generic product for which margins are tiny for which there was a huge amount of infrastructure required um and i don't think anyone was really making any money per packet on these things um so it's kind of thinking back you know 17 years ago that this seems to be like an era we're entering now where there's going to be more we need to get more drugs to patients this is patient requirement more you know rarer diseases higher risk um uh populations what can we do to get the drugs to them quicker what can we do to stop this you know or reduce this 15-year development cycle um it's going to be things like risk minimization additional risk minimization measures more intense monitoring but that will come at quite literally a cost um and I think you know we, it, that's the kind of thing we can look to to look back to 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 say, well, actually, what can we do to uh, to try and reduce that and and rationalise what we do? Um, so yeah, it was a it was a great place to kind of set the stall of this is what PV can do, um, and 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 not just it's something that happens. Um, having said that, it was one product. Uh, and it was fairly, you know, there was not a lot outside that. It kind of the company didn't have a huge amount, so I thought, well, let's go and let's go and um, do a lot, you know, get full exposure to the kind of the whole system with lots of mm-hmm. products. And um, so I then moved to a company called Arrow, um, which were a sort of reasonable, you know, small, medium-sized generics company headquartered in the UK, a um, couple of EU or European. Uh, affiliates we had someone in canada as well um and again just by sort of coincidence you know bit, there's a lot i think there's been a lot of um serendipity uh, in my in my career of just being kind of right place at, at right time um again it was a it was a great place to learn the full spectrum of of pharmacovigilance i had you know, an absolute the pv team had been built up by a, a fantastic head of the department who uh who was growing it growing it with the company um i was really att- you know really hammered home the attention to detail um you know, that and that is ultimately everyone in pv is a bit kind of uh ocd with details and, <laughs> and, and having to get things uh you know absolutely right and perfect um you know we've all got that tendency in us i think but it was um Again, particularly, it was it was a really valuable lesson I learned throughout that. Um, and I think after on my second day, I sent a load of blank discs, uh, meaning to contain PSURs to regulators across Europe. Um, and so that was uh, that was a valuable lesson to um, <laughs> just check that you have properly burnt <laughs> files onto the onto the DVD. Um, so I, I was given a pass on that one, and. Um, and then I think I think I uh, developed into quite a decent PV professional there, <laughs> um, but probably not the. Uh, wouldn't recommend for anyone else in their first first couple of days at a job. Um, but that was yeah, you know, and that was kind of a really quickly it ended up being quite a fast growing company, um, both because of the number of products we had we had in. It was I was there over the. Uh, 2012 gvp modules 
um and you know that that i was up to my you know, up to my eyeballs in sops and impact assessments and kind of really the face of pharmacovigilance in europe changed at that point of, of what was required there was this you know the the great calls of you know and great expectations of harmonization and you know, mm-hmm. before we know it we're all going to be working exactly in step with each other and we're not going to have any more confusing two-page checklists on where this literature case needs to be sent depending on the status of you know, the type of license you've got and where it's marked it, we were just going to send it to Udra vigilance and then we'd never have to think about anything you know wouldn't have to think about that again we could just write a you know everything would be standardized um yeah, that, unfortunately, that's not quite worked out. But um, it was a it, it was a great dream while we had it, and um, but yeah, it was a great it was okay, fantastic to kind of be implementing thousands of pages of regulations um, and 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 building out a PV system. And we also there went through quite big acquisition from Watson Pharma. It's a big US company. Well, it was big, yeah, it was a big US company. I confess, I kind of lose track now of where these products and who we are there was the then there was a merger with activists mm-hmm. something happened with teva after my yeah. it it just suddenly it went from being quite a you know a, a small small company to hugely global my first first kind of uh experience of pv systems and large data migrations of tens of thousands of rows of of different product names trying to get excel spreadsheets two other different types of pv systems all into argus um and again i thought 13 you know, four, oh sorry oh, yeah what were we 12 years ago i thought pv migrations are going to be so much easier later in my career this is going to <laughs> this, this is a pointless exercise to go through i'll never have to think about this again um but again it's it's amazing how uh uh how little you know ultimately uh things haven't changed a huge amount there um so yeah i was at harrow for four and a half years it was it was brilliant um and i kind of i you know what i remember when i started there someone saying to me oh give me a give me a call when you want to learn about proper pv because they were Hmm. very much they were big pharma backgrounds that's what they did and I look back and I think I'd actually recommend a a generics company with, with a a smallish sized or medium sized generics company is actually a fantastic place to learn PV because you can't just sit there and do your case processing and then pass it on to another team that you don't. It's you know, I think it was there I kind of quite quickly realized that I'm I like I'm nosy enough I'm to kind of want to be involved enough and understand how things fit together. That's so I think mm-hmm. I. I I can leave proper PV to other people. <laughs> just worrying about your one area. I just want to get involved with with everything. So yeah, I'd recommend generics as a as a great place to learn. You're still following. You're following all the GVPs. Uh, you've probably got yeah complex complex distribution agreements. So um, you still got the same. You know, still held to the same inspection standards. So yeah, I thought that was that was great. But having said that, I thought let's jump to the other end of the spectrum. And go and learn about clinical trials, <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I really did. I went to I went to work for Cancer Research UK and mm-hmm. worked in phase one and phase two studies there, um, and uh, headed up their PV team. And so they've got this the, the Centre for Drug Development now. It's called the Drug Development Office. When I started, um, has this little this little department that most people don't know about that it. Basically, it is spon- it is sponsor of its own clinical trials, taking deprioritized products from big pharma or take it or products from smaller biotechs that need a kind of proof of concept, but takes takes the product, is entirely sponsor of everything, has everything in-house, CRAs, data management, um, actually PV, QA, everything. It's not a kind of it it sort of sits aside from the rest of their funding model of like it run it runs everything and again from days when we were back in the office i was sat less than 20 you know, 20 feet from every function so if you mm-hmm. didn't know if you didn't know clinical trials going into it 
you certainly knew about it pretty quickly because you would overhear conversations. You could wander up to someone and say, well, actually, what does we're doing this with the safety database? What's the impact of that on on data management? What's what do the physician, you know, what do the medics think of that? And you just had everyone in this small team um, working on sort of 15 studies at a time, you know, 10, 15 studies all the way through from, you know, bench to bed to, to bedside. And it was, yeah, it was, it was a great, a real kind of great place to learn. And it, as well as, as well as it being small and that kind of aspect, every, because of the kind of environment it was, everyone, you go and work for a charity for because you want to be there. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it, you, everyone has a, you know, either a, a belief in what they're specifically what they're doing or or just wants to be involved in charity you know a charity's work for a bit um so it kind of led to a really good environment and and kind of an i'd say an environment and a culture is the hot top that i think and i'd encourage every company to have and i'd like to think that kind of have a drive phase as you know take it that through drive phase as well of of people really caring about what they do and when wanting to and being conscientious and and being innovative and being and and taking some risks but in kind of an an ethical framework so they had the opportunity you know they're working with with donate you know donors money you know we're not they're not awash with with cash so they do have to be very careful about how it's spent and you know not spend where it shouldn't be and and but on the other hand because everyone's at a charity and almost by default wants to do everything ethically and right there was that band there was more of an opportunity to say well we should do this because it should be done this way um, mm-hmm. because we believe it's done so and you know they i think just before i'd started you know, a few years before i'd started there there was the northwick park um was it TGM oh, yeah. scandal? Mm-hmm. Satanic, the, the elephant man trial. These, and I can't remember the name of the report that came out of it now. But there was there was a, a big report came out and a number of suggestions about how clinical trials should be run in the in the UK. And the list of suggestions was kind of if you looked at it now, you would think it was crazy that anyone wasn't doing that. Um, but actually, it had very little impact on CDD because they were already doing these things because say looking back they seemed they looked like and they were the right thing to do they just weren't necessarily mandated by the regulator it was kind of working within the spirit of the law rather than to the letter you know things Mm -hmm. like they always conducted their studies in phase one units attached to hospital with you know an an a&e department and everything because that was what that was by chance Northwick Park was attached to it the phase one unit didn't have to be attached to emergency medical uh you know facilities so it's things like and so it gave again gave me this sort of like particularly around having gone through the GVPs changes and seeing how the rules had gone like that to that but that made me see as well though actually whatever rules and regs and legislation there might be there's you know there is a you can't just stop or you shouldn't just stop there. There's a lot of gray area in between and say the spirit mm-hmm. versus the rule. And it was a kind of, it was a good focus. Say you can do really good science. You can be bringing benefit to patients and you can not be doing it on the absolute, you know, that you can be doing it in the right way. Um, and that what you believe is the right thing to do. And really, and as I've said, but we really be innovative. There was lots of work with Transcelerate around, particularly around risk-based monitoring in studies, because, we did have limited, we had limited numbers of CRAs and we were running more stuff and we needed to do it in a, in a proportionate way. But that, it was, that was a really big piece of work they did because it had benefit to everyone rather than just going, Oh, we'll introduce you. We'll do it in the way we think we can get away with. It was like, no, we're going to lead the way with this is best practice of how you can do risk-based monitoring without, uh, compromising patient safety. Um, so yeah, that was yeah, it was a really, it's a, it was a really, really um, interesting place to work. Um, and then I made my first, my first step into onto the the other side of things, onto the dark side of outsourcing and uh, and CROs. Um, Scout, I'd been kind of, I'd gone from one side to the other. I'd gone generics, 
clinical trials. And I thought, I like both. Let's find a decent balance of it. Um, and so I went to a data-focused CRO um, called Quanticate. Um, so they didn't really run the studies themselves, but offered biostats, data management, and as well that had, had pharmacovigilance. Um, so I headed up their PV team. Um, again, really interesting period. You know, I've kind of every move I've kind of looked, been looking for something new and broadly been pretty sort of successful and kind of filling in gaps in where I had knowledge. So, you know, it was, that was a particularly a hot time for offshoring. So we, you know, we established and, and, and grew uh, um, an office in, in India and, and trained up the team there. And that was, that was really kind of interesting piece of work and uh, well it wasn't it never stopped it wasn't just a piece of work probably over the years of of training up a group and you kind of thought uh, because there was such a move towards it um but you I, it talks a lot there's a lot there's a lot of cultural differences in the ways of working and things like globally and in particular i think in these regions and so working with to build up a team that you kind of you feel addresses kind of what's considered weak I mean, sometimes weaknesses of and uh of the offshoring model and saying, well, actually you can do it. You, you can do it in exactly the same way as the UK. These, you've empowered your team to, to make decisions, to not defer, you know, and to, to question things. Um, and offshoring doesn't just have to be a, we're sending out there, follow these instructions, send it back to the UK, the U S where decisions will be made and, and where the, you know, the, the big, you know, the, the larger chunks of work will be. So, it was, you know, an invaluable, um, invaluable piece of work there. Uh, lots more database stuff. Um, where I think we realised that where we actually first met each other, I see you as uh, in an in an Argus pitch, I think. Um, yeah. Yes. And, indeed. And again, that was an interesting period of or a project that often regs versus you know requirements versus versus recommendations we were again e2b r3 had been had been such a hot topic for years of we need to be ready for it we need it's gone live it's gone live and i and as we're doing it's like we should be at you know in the vanguard of this and we should be we need a database upgrade anyway let's we'll we'll get r3 in we'll be ahead of the game um and we did that, and we were, you know, we were legitimately. I think we were up and running with R three for clients m- much earlier than, well, as I discovered, years earlier than others who were leaving it right <laughs> until the last minute. Um, but then you, f- but then you find actually was that you know this, it's about, it wasn't mandated. It was a best practice. It was quite clearly not a commercial driver for coming. It the, the R three was not a differentiator because oh you don't have to do it, therefore why do we you know you had to have a particular type of client who just wanted who was particularly interested in in it being a project in itself. So I think that's you know a lot of, of the work that you guys at, uh, at Trillion do with with tech. It's kind of work and, and the integration of that. It's working with this small group of companies that really want to be at the forefront of things. They don't have to do things. But they want to because they know it's coming and they can see the benefit of it and potentially you know, best practice of the integration of these of these things rather than it being a, being mandatory. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think that was so. Um, yeah, we worked on with Quanticate was yeah, fairly so we worked clinical and and and, and post marketing stuff there also for a couple of years and then that's when drive phase happened. I thought, well, I've seen myself through all the phases. I've done a couple of years. <laughs> done, done a couple of years at, at, at a CRO to think I know how things work in a more business manner. Uh, and so set up drive phase um, next month. We're yeah, five, a month away from six years of trading. Oh, um, wow. Which will be, um, yeah, don't, it's, fl- it's flown by. Um, and yeah, it's been a been a great six great six years i mean there you know and i can't see i can't see that um i think i'm institutionalized now for my own 
be in my own company. My wife sort of couldn't go back to work for someone else. And what I really like now is that the ability to kind of work with almost like as a as a consultant, you almost by definition, when a company you need to con- wants a consultant in or wants a project team, they have bought into the change and need and and what needs to be done. Um rather than you know, there is a reason they are bringing you in because they need something changed and something done so you kind of already have that engagement that mm-hmm. that drive to do to deliver something whereas often in house if you know think data you know the day job can get in the way um if things aren't broke don't fix them as a consultant you're that other side of things are broke can you <laughs> we need to fix them um so it always keeps keeps things interesting um and yeah that sort of helping them what's the phrase yeah helping them navigate the regulatory waters um and the you know the the difficulties of of being compliant trying to predict where things are going um you know as i mentioned that uh, gvps in 2012 we thought we were going to be harmonized we thought we knew where, where we were going to stand and I don't think we're really much further a lot. You know, I think there were a few years where it looked like we we're moving in the right direction. And now it seems like there's more and more exceptions, more and more kind of, uh, you know, with DSUR, DSURs, country specific annexes, you know, I do tend to think like, what's the point of having a standardized format for a DSUR if you then have country specific annexes where everyone can say, oh, but we want it slightly differently. It kind of, mm-hmm. it, it seems counterintuitive mm-hmm. um you know we're particularly depending on the way you look at it sort of exciting or frustrating period with you know through through brexit and the like with you know the mhra's global standing and i mean i think we all probably worry about the the uk standing in in everything at the moment um but kind of watching and you know which will be from the direction of travel that the MHRA takes um, in terms of what does it harmonize on? Do we, you know, there's lots of work being done with the FDA and Health Canada, but we still, we are still part of Europe. If not, you know, if not part of, yeah, uh, if not politically, we're still just over the channel and they're our closest. So, and still normally work under most of the GVPs. So where, where do they, where do they start to hitch their wagon? Um, do they start to become, you know, try and become a leader and and influence things and take countries, uh, take other regulators along with them? Um, I think we're kind of at a yeah at the start of of what could be a quite an interesting few years. I mean, it certainly looks like the we've just had. I mean, we just had the MHRA symposium this week, a couple of days ago as we record this, so, and it. It does sound like there's an awful lot of, um, I guess, talk of being proportionate, risk-based, a, an, an attempt to reduce the burden on industry, um, whether that's a primary driver to reduce the burden on industry or because the MHRA has been left in you know, left with serious funding shortfalls because of Brexit um, and kind of needs to, to cut its cloth accordingly. We, you know, we don't know and we'll see how it, how it plays out. Um, I mean, I do have, and I think the so June rain had said that it really wants the MHRA to be an enabler of the industry um, and to, to be able to bring drugs to market quicker. And to quite- that, to that exact point, it's something that you mentioned earlier about bringing drugs to market. And you were talking about, you know, the focus on maybe rare diseases, etc. But how about lifestyle sort of drugs that are, quite frankly, making a lot of companies a lot of money right now? Um, how is that how companies could mitigate this cost um, problem? Because if i take a step back for instance pfizer is a is a very good example they made a lot of money off the covid vaccine um and now they're in a situation where you know the covid vaccine's not selling as much um where are they investing that money 
do they invest it in rare diseases or do they invest it in potentially more lifestyle drugs, which will obviously increase revenue so that at least they can continue to do um, uh, research into some of the more rare drugs? So do you mean, how could they attain change in focus of the companies or an ability yeah. to bring them to market? I mean, I think if you look at yeah, the Novo is going to be kind of the the company to follow at the you know for the you know, from the last year of everyone's going that's that that's quite a good good kind of product to to jump on the bandwagon for. Um, I'm going to get into like. In terms of regulation and kind of strength of, of and, and and what that actually does mean for the industry, I have some concerns that and and in terms of the strength of you know ultimately who is who is properly enforcing regulations. You know, I know, mm-hmm. you know no, Novo have been was it get a two year uh, ban from the ABPI for um, from breaking so you know breaking up their code of conduct um ultimately does that matter has that you know just does, does, what's the discuss what was actually the um the deterrent for breaking the abpi code of, of conduct a two-year a two-year ban versus sales and uh, share price that that flies up and i kind of feel that that you know, similarly with with PV, with these kind of lifestyle drugs that they are they are licensed for a very particular indication, which is clearly being prescribed outside of. Um, well, actually, if something does happen with that, who is who is insure who is keeping an eye on that who is enforcing that the pv is being proper that the the safety is being properly monitored that different patient populations are and and, and affecting that are being looked at benefit risk in the different population you know is okay should this be limited to this population is it okay to open up where's where are the different benefit list risks um lining up i remember from covid the um when the uh, cardiovascular, what was it? the cardiovascular side effect? I can't remember which one it was now. Um, came and uh, which was actually, I think, I remember first spotted in Israel because they had a very particular. I think it was a very particularly young gr- cohort of of, of people being um, vaccinated. But the as part of the daily briefs that we were we were all getting. I thought there were some really good slides on benefit risk in each age group. So it was saying, mm-hmm. at a, obviously, it's at a population level rather than an individual. It was saying, look, we are not, I think it was when they said that if you're under 30, you're not going to get AZ anymore. Um, because they showed, like, if you are under 30, your risk of getting, of dying of COVID or getting seriously ill is tiny. The risk of getting this side effect is slightly larger. So it's not worth you having. But once you hit 30, you're in trouble with COVID. <laughs> so it is worth it. So it was trying to explain, but it was a really good graphic of the benefit risk is not static. And so I think I'm always wary of when products are being used widely outside of their indication, their licensed indication, who is ultimately responsible? Who is going to carry the can if something goes wrong? Most great drug scandals are not due to the drug being bad. It has gone through clinical trials. It has been licensed in a in a indication in a population for a reason. The scandals always involve it's been overused. It's been people companies regulators have been aware of it but are kind of tied in knots of you know like chuckle brothers it's to you to you so you know and no it's that everyone is responsible but no one's responsible yeah and we see it in every kind of regulate you know we've got in the uk the post office we've got uh water you know water pollution at the moment and everyone knows it's going on 
but no one's truly responsible for fixing it and the cost of fixing and i don't just mean the monetary to fix a a pipe or whatever the cost the structural cost of how society works is too is too big to to fix it at that point and how how do you feel then with the changes circling back to the point where i diverged this conversation <laughs> um um how do the changes with mhra and you know obviously you were at the symposium how do they make you feel as a pv professional i think that they make me feel a bit ner- i was going to say a bit nervous but as a p pe- i think poss- i think it does a disservice to pv in the uk uh particularly because there's a you know there's you know that's where i'm based and that's where the mh are out but i think they've done su- there's been such good work done over you know comms wise in pv and we're not you know again we're very details orientated we're not very good at promotion and marketing and, and and things of changing that story from it's a tick box you've got to do will stop you getting inspection findings to commercial driver the number of audits that are done now because the fear of inspections has been just sort of implanted regardless of whether actually the outcome and uh, remedial action is is a problem you know that, that they've done a really good job there is more audits pv auditing done now than ever before and it primarily is driven most of it is driven by a fear of the regulators coming in and something ha- and, and something coming at that rather than commercial drivers obviously there are some you know some companies where pv and risk minimization measures are are driving it and and, and slightly different um so i feel it kind of a stepping back from that and saying we're gonna you know there are gonna there are fewer inspections that we actually expect less of less of you so clinical trial proposals to ground well don't don't worry about submitting individual suicides you just need to have a proportionate safety system and and do your own analysis and then your dsur can just focus on on risks rather than giving us listings and things I think it pushes back to like, oh, well, if, actually, if we have to do less, we're going to do less. And if they're going to inspect less, we're going to have, you know, they're going to be, we're, we're less likely to be seen. I think it rose back um, on what, and yeah, on what PV has accomplished to the, as, as a function, has accomplished on its, on its growth today. I think it undermines the, the ability then to be able to say well, we can get your drug to market quicker because you certainly can't be doing that if you've got a minimal and you know, a minimal pv system do you think this moves away from putting the patient first that i think that's an, a particularly interesting question because depending on let's allow i'm i'll, I'll take another tangent if you look at sodium valproate which i think i wrote my first i think when i set up dry phase i wrote my first blog about to try and show some insights um that's you know the number of patients have been affected by that is horrendous and they've had the cumberledge report and it's looked and i it's been going on for so long anyone who's in the industry is kind of knew it was tetragenic anyway but in terms of playing out in public in lots this week about oh, well, what more should be done to restrict access and things like that. And then on the other side, you have the patients who actually need it, who it is vital for their day-to-day functioning. That they So it, I think it, in some ways, reducing PV doesn't put the patient first because it puts them at more risk. But on the other hand, those who want earlier access, those who want to be able to take drug as individual, that it's putting them, I think it, it, it's swinging from one kind of putting the patient, it's swinging from putting patient safety first to putting patient treatment first, I think. So depending on what camp you're in, and it could change from drug to drug, you'll support some stricter PV on some and and, and reduction of, of, uh, um, of access to it. But for another drug which you really need, you go, well, I don't care. I, no, 
I want that. Don't worry about the PV. So surely the answer is post-market studies, no? Well, I think, yeah, I think that's <laughs> going to be the way we things are going to go. Uh, well, it looks like they are. I think they're particularly, particularly um, interesting sessions with the MHRA around their, um, their NI pass inspections. Um, mm-hmm. Really interesting about how much more uh, labor intensive they are as well and how long they're t- I think it was something like 20, d- 20 inspector days compared to nine for a standard PV uh, inspection. Um, but it, it that I think it, more post authorization studies um, then will need to lead to a kind of a fundamental shift in kind of, I guess, how thing how things look after a drug's marketed because it's shifting a lot of cost. There's a lot of additional oversight. Um, it's a just, it's a changing a way of, of thinking about things, which I think is actually would be for the better because there can be an element of, um, you know, once a drug's been approved, oh yeah, it's fine. Um, and I think this really, it's a real bugbear of mine when people call phase one study safety studies. It's like, well, and then we move on to efficacy. It's like, well, it's not, it, well, it is, it's proving that it's not catastrophically toxic, um, but it's not a safety study. It, it doesn't prove the safety of it, but there can be a thought that even once you've done, you know, phase one, oh yeah, it's safe enough. So in post-authorization studies are going to be the way we go, but there's going to have to be a kind of, whatever the horrendous cost of developing and bringing a drug to market is at the moment, there's going to have to be a, it's going to have to allow for an equal reduction in that development time um to fund mm-hmm. it otherwise you know the the it's not going to be sustainable for either payers whether in the you know states insurance here the nhs com- combination in the eu even something like sodium valproate i said if the risk minimization measure is you have to get each patient to sign a form to say i've understood the risks i've ta- i have this has been explained to me i know what it is whether it be a form, a video, or whatever, you get 10 minutes with your GP. You get a 10-minute slot in the UK to talk, speak to your GP about one thing. It's not if more drugs come, have more of those risk minimization measures, and you know, particularly elderly patients, polypharmacy, and all that, are they, the you know, GPs are not going to be able to, to, to cope with having a patient have to have, I don't know, five different, um appointments over the course of the week to be informed about the drugs that they're about to be prescribed the patients aren't going to be able to come in so it's i think in terms of safety and that does look like a logical way to go but i think again the wider kind of health healthcare system um impacts need to be thought through um because I mean, I don't know. Lost. Trying to get an appointment with the GP is bad at the, at the best of times. So. <laughs> um. so, Tom, thank you for the discussion today. There, there is a final question I, that I need to ask, um, and it's quite an for me. It's quite an important one, and it's pretty simple, really. Is uh, what's next for PV? I wish I wish I had a simple answer for it. I think. <laughs> I mean, it's. I think it's a case of we continue to muddle along. Um, it's. I. I. You know, if you'd asked me a few years ago, I'd have said harmonisation. I think what I think in reality, what looks like next for for PV is um, decreased harmonisation, more complexity introduced into into our day to day work. Um, and I mean, it would be it would probably be remiss to not mention something about AI and and the glory of that. But we I almost think, made a whole episode I, well, not I'm, saying AI. I'm going to say I'm going to say I actually don't think at this stage I don't think it that is going to make an inherent difference to what we do. I think its uses certainly you know where it's being taught. It is about pulling together the information it's about being able to it's having slightly cleverer ways of pulling stuff from your databases and together but as you know that is not pharmacovigilance that's the building blocks of what pv can achieve of bringing clozapine back to the market making sure that you know um 
making drugs available to populations they wouldn't know. That's what PV is. So I don't I think the future is let's not get sidetracked by the tools, which the tools are I'm sure will be great and are giving us great building blocks, but that's not ultimately what our job should be about. It's about how do we use that to to benefit you know to benefit patients and bring and bring drugs safely to market. I think that's a very good answer. And actually, <clears throat> I was I was just thinking um, on that on 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 your answer. Can can the tools bring in? Can uh, the to- uh, the tools being brought in? Can they push PV into where it needs to be? Which is I, you've mentioned it a f- few times, which is to be looked upon as a commercially viable unit in itself by maybe pushing it towards the the early phases of a clinical trial and to say that actually these tools could almost predict in some certain aspect of if this drug will be of benefit to a patient. Um, obviously, there's lots, lots of companies you're trying to do, you know, the identify targets and and what and the next logical step of that is being able to prove like actually how much how how much quicker that or how much how much better those targets are so i think it's the target finding the targets is the first step predicted safety profile yes that um uh that can help. I think it would be, there's a lot of work you can do on your predicting your safety profile as it stands. You know, the DIA has done a couple of great um, papers on um, help, off, help, um, helping to implement an FDA rule around aggregate report. Uh, sorry, you know, aggregate safety review. That is a, that's possible to do now. You build up what your baseline is. You look at what you're, you know, what you're anticipating to do. So, Yes, AI will, and, and tools like you know, additional tools will be able to help speed that up. But I think it will be a sad, it's a sad state of affairs if we're having to wait for someone. To, when you can do that now, that companies would have to wait to have a shiny new toy to say, "Oh yeah, we can we can do that and and press a button." You can companies can do that now with the and and, and start to build things out. Have a development risk. How many companies have a development risk management plan? Mm-hmm. you go and go oh we might do a development risk management plan you know you'll know from phase you know you can start planning from phase two of what you think it's you might need to do by the time you get to market um you know that you shouldn't you know you shouldn't be see or you wouldn't expect to see massive problems with the you know completely unexpected safety problems by the time you're getting towards your phase you know by t- the end of your phase three um you kind of know where you're going to stand roughly get a development risk management plan in place yes i know there are providers doing you know um uh tools to help put that together again it's pulling together information you've already got um so but yes i agree with you that it could do that i just think it's a bit sad that it's not done already because it's almost like it's it's going to need those non-pv people with their more commercial and marketing minded to say this is you should do this guys um to get yeah to get the company set up but yeah maybe that is it's incumbent upon us to uh to keep pushing that ourselves tom it's been a fascinating conversation uh, as always with you um thank you very much for joining me today thank you apologies for a bit, bit ranty and uh <laughs> soliloquy uh but it's been good summer fun.